All right. We're going to have to get you another device. What do y'all see? You see the opening plate. The uh... Meet me at the manger? Yes. Okay. Awesome sauce. Let's get going. Uh, okay. I want to, and since this is Abbott, we're going to start this service, this, this lesson, uh, just uh, reintroducing Advent to those of you who are familiar and then uh, introducing it to those of you who aren't. And then we're going to, we're going to cover chapters one and two in Luke over the next uh, three weeks. And um, I pray that you find it enriching. This is a little short video. <laughs> Let's go over briefly what Advent is. Why won't it let me? What did I do? Y'all did see that video, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Why won't it let me? Oh, there we go. Okay, somebody want to give us this this reading of what what Advent is, the history and the meaning. What is Anybody. Advent, history and the meaning? Some people may know that Advent season focus on the expectation and think that it is, it is served as an anticipation of Christ's birth in the season leading up to Christmas. Mm -hmm. This part of the story, this is part of the story, but there is more to Advent. The word Advent is derived from the Latin word adventures, meaning coming, which translate to the Greek word what perusia scholars believe that during the fourth and fifth century in spain and gaul advent was a season of preparation for the baptism of new christian at the january feast of Epiphany. 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 Mm -hmm. the celebration of god's incarnation represented by the visit of the magi to the baby jesus his baptism in Jordan River by John the Baptist and his first miracle at Canaan. During this season of preparation, Christian would spend 40 days in penitence, penance, mm -hmm. prayers, and fasting to prepare for this celebration. Originally, there was little connection between Advent and Christmas. Mm -hmm. I spent some time today speaking with uh, I'm, I'm literally having one-on-one -on -one, uh, spiritual checkup sessions with my steward board. And so I sat with um, uh, the Riggleman's individually today, although he's not going up for the steward board. But I, I went into this discussion with him as to uh, how I get these questions every year about Christmas from these people who seem to be very angry with God. It wasn't his birthday. He wasn't born in a manger and the, the, the Magi didn't come on the day he was, you know, and I'm like, okay. And, you know, um, we do so many. And then like you guys said, you know, uh, uh, a lot of the opposition to decorating trees or even coloring Easter eggs for that matter is wrapped around 
uh, people's belief that it's anti-Christian. Mm. And the actual Christmas celebration, the, the, not the celebration, but the mass, Christ mass, uh, was, was invented by the Roman Catholic Church. It's a church mm. thing. Everything that we do uh, today is not in the Bible. It was mm. not meant to it was not celebrated in the Bible. Say your birthdays. Nobody's birthday is celebrated in the Bible, mm. uh, but we celebrate our birthdays. So it, it just seemed just strange to me how people would take a little tidbit and just devalue the whole word. Anyway, I just I just thought I'd add add to that. So a lot of things that we do derives from pagan practices, but we have to remember that the religion then was exclusively Jewish, and they believed anything that wasn't Jewish was pagan. Mm. So that would have been everybody and everything. <laughs> but it's not a big deal. I love Christmas. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, by the sixth century. Go ahead, Sister Joanne. I cut you off. By the sixth century, however, Roman Christian had tied advent to the coming of christ but the coming they had in mind was not christ first coming in the manger in bethlehem but his second coming in the clouds as the judge of the world it was not until the middle age that advent season was explicitly linked to christ first coming at christmas hmm. and so you may recall in the sermon sunday uh i preached about how isaiah was was prophesying uh, really about the second coming, not not his birth. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about the symbolism of, of what Advent is. And I guess my interjection earlier was about <laughs> the fact that none of these practices started out being what they are today. Advent started out being about something totally different and last instead of lasting 40 uh 40 weeks now is four, uh, 40 weeks, 40 days now is four weeks, that kind of a thing. So it, it, things evolve in Christianity. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's interesting how uh, the 40 days of Advent, well, as related to Advent, is similar to the 40 days of um, uh, Lent. When, Lent when Pick we, that up, did you? Uh, also, I'm, also that's the 40 days. New. Yeah. So our two our two our two major uh liturgical seasons that we're gonna observe anyway is Advent and Lent. Yes. We celebrate as Christians, probably universally, uh, his birth and his resurrection. And those seasons lead up to those two events. Right. Uh and so then they they kind of skew them all together. Mm -hmm. what it's saying so now Advent is, is focused on the, the the first coming as well as the second coming and then we we have Lent that celebrates the resurrection and we're looking at and, and in those seasons all we're doing is is looking at what preceded those events mm -hmm. right yes. uh, when we get when we right now we're doing Advent we're saying meet me at the at the manger and then the sermon series is uh, Christ is coming it's all about what preceded the actual birth Mm -hmm. And then the Lenten season will be journeying to the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll look at the things that happened that preceded uh, the time that he was in the cross. So it, it's religion is man-made. It's, it's not, you know, biblical, but it keeps us in the environment. Amen. This is something to celebrate. This is something to pass down to the next generation, the generation and generations from us mm -hmm. uh, as we have received it. I, I call it organized religion. Okay. Amen. And most connected Protestant churches and Catholic churches celebrate these two major liturgical seasons. Hold on, somebody chatted something. Y'all can see the chat right away, but I mm -hmm. can't. Yeah, Sister Phaedra said that is something very unique and distinctive about the number 40. Yeah. Uh, yes. As Phaedra just said, it rained for 40 days yes. during the flood. Um, the, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus. There's something significant about that that number 40, and it tends to mean travail uh, or waiting. Um, I have to look it up specifically, but somewhere along those lines. So, yeah, symbolism is big in the Bible, but numbers are very, very significant. 
I wouldn't I wouldn't call it a coincidence and by any means. Okay, somebody want to get the symbolism? Did we already read it? Mm -mm. No, I, I disturbed her. Sorry. You jumped up ahead. That's okay. This is us learning together. Go ahead. Somebody. Advent symbolism. Advent symbolizes the present situation of the church in these last days. Hmm. As God's people wait for the return of Christian of the return of Christ in glory to consummate his eternal kingdom. The church is in a similar situation to Israel at the end of the Old Testament, in exile, waiting and hoping in prayerful expectation for the coming of the Messiah. Israel looked back to God's past gracious actions on their behalf and leading them out of Egypt in the Exodus. And on this basis, they called for God once again to act for them. In the same way, the church during Advent looks back upon Christ's coming in celebration while at the same time looking forward in eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns for his people. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. In the season of Advent, we're, we're, we're waiting, uh, but we're, we're waiting with expectation while also commemorating yeah. or looking back. Amen. Why is this not working? Okay. Any, any comments about that? I thought that was interesting. And that's what we're doing as we lead up to Christmas Day. Okay, this is the last thing about Advent. Someone want to read this little, little piece, uh, the liturgy and practice. Advent liturgy and, liturgy and practice. To balance the two elements of remembrance and anticipation, the first two Sundays in Advent through December 16th, look forward to Christ's second coming. And the last two Sundays, 7, December 17th, 24th, look backward to remember Christ's first coming. Over the course of the four weeks, scripture readings move from passages about Christ's return and judgment to Old Testament passages about the expectation of the coming Messiah to New Testament passages about the announcement of Christ's arrival by John the Baptist and the angels. Wow. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't the last piece. This is, I think this is the last. Yeah, this is the last piece. It ties it all, ties it all in. All right, somebody else is coming in. Uh-oh, here comes Fire Tablet, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody read about Advent and the Christian life. Amen. Advent and the Christian life. While Advent is certainly a time of celebration and anticipation of Christ's birth, it is more than that. It is only in the shadow of Advent that the miracle of Christmas can be fully understood and appreciated. And mm. it is only in the light of Christmas that the Christian life makes any sense. Mm. It is between the fulfilled promise of Christ's first coming and the yet to be fulfilled promise of his second coming that Karl Barth penned these words, unfulfilled and fulfilled promise mm. are related to each other as are dawn and sunrise, both promise and in fact, the same promise. Mm. If anywhere at all, then it is precisely in the light of the coming of Christ that faith has become Advent faith, the expectation of future revelation. But faith knows for whom and for what it is waiting. It is fulfilled faith because it lays hold on the fulfilled promise. Amen. So before I got really into the liturgical seasons, Christmas was for me what it was for most of the world, even most of the church world. You know, Christmas Day came, you open presents, whatever, you go to church, you, you, you know, you acknowledge that Christ was born. But what the Advent season does uh, is, is we have these reminders each, each week, and it just makes it so much more enriching. Uh, and the expectation as you put yourself in the place of these people who were suffering. These people were suffering and going through so much and all they had to hope for 
was that the Messiah was coming. And so you're, 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 you're learning about some of that oppression as we uh, get closer and, and meet up at the manger on Christmas Day as to why uh, it was so emphasized, why it, was, it, it became so much more than just a, a national holiday or uh, a consumer day. Amen. It, it, have, just following it through the Advent uh, liturgical season just just makes it that much more special and precious to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to begin our study. Right now, we're just studying this tonight, the first 25 verses in the Gospel of uh, Luke. Amen. That's where mm -hmm. all the action happens. Luke tells the story from uh, of Christ's birth, um, the only gospel that does. Really? The Gospel of Luke. Luke investigated many of the earliest eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus and then composed this account. And the story begins up in the hills of Jerusalem, the place where Israel's ancient prophets said that God himself would come one day to establish his kingdom over all the earth. In this city is the temple run by the priests, and one of them, named Zechariah, was working in the temple when he had a vision that freaks him out. An angel appears and says that he and his wife will have a son. What's this all about? Well, Zechariah and his wife, we're told, are very old. They've never been able to have children. And Luke's setting up a parallel here with Abraham and Sarah, the great ancestors of Israel, because they too were very old and could never have kids. Yet God gave them a son, Isaac, which is how the whole story of Israel began. And so Luke's implying here that God's about to do something that significant for this people once again. The angel tells Zechariah to name the son John. And then he says that this son's going to fulfill a promise of Israel's ancient prophets, that somebody would come one day to prepare Israel to meet their God when he arrived to rule in Jerusalem. Because right now, Jerusalem is ruled by the Romans. Yeah, specifically, it's governed by a man named Herod, who's a puppet king under the Roman Empire. And so the Jewish people wanted nothing more than to be free and govern themselves in their own land. So this is shocking news. Everything's going to change. God's on his way. But how is he going to arrive? Well, to find out, Luke takes us out of Jerusalem and then up into a small town in the hills of an out-of-the-way region called Galilee. And there we find a young woman named Mariam, or we call her Mary. She was engaged to be married. And then an angel appears to Mary saying that she's going to have a son. She's supposed to name him Jesus, which in Hebrew means the Lord saves. And he will be a king like David who will rule over God's people forever. And then Mary asks, okay, well, how is this possible? Because I'm a virgin. And she's told that the same Holy Spirit that brought life and light out of darkness in Genesis chapter 1 is going to generate life inside her womb. God is about to bind himself to humanity through the conception and the birth of the Messiah. And so Mary goes from some backwoods no-name girl to the future mother of the king? Exactly. In fact, she sings a song about how this reversal of her own social status points to a greater upheaval to come. Through her son, God's going to bring down rulers from their thrones and exalt the poor and the humble. He's going to turn the whole world order upside down. So when Mary was really pregnant, she and her fiancé, Joseph, had to go down to Bethlehem. Yeah, there was a decree across the Roman Empire about new taxes, and so everybody had to go get registered in the town of their family line. There were so many visitors in Bethlehem, they can't find a guest room. And so the only place they can find is a spot where animals sleep. Now nearby were some shepherds with their flocks, and an angel appears, which, of course, freaks them out. But they're told to celebrate because tonight in Bethlehem, a savior has been born. Yeah, they're told to go and find this baby, and they'll know that it's the Messiah because he's going to be wrapped up and laying in a grimy feeding trough. Yeah, which is pretty gross. Totally. And then these shepherds, who aren't very clean themselves, they go and find the newborn Jesus in this really dingy place, and their minds are blown. They go home wondering what on earth is about to happen. And this is all really strange. I mean, if God's really coming to save the world, this isn't how you would expect him to arrive, born in an animal shelter 
shelter to a teenage mm. girl celebrated by no-name shepherds. Exactly. I mean, everything is backwards in Luke's story, and that's the point. He is showing how God's kingdom was first revealed in these dirty places among the poor because Jesus is here to bring salvation by turning our world order upside down. I need to make a correction. Um, I prefer <laughs> the story of Christmas in the Gospel of Luke. Matthew also tells it, but they tell it from a different perspective. Luke's yeah. is, is more of him as a deity. Matthew's is more like a news report. Um, he starts with the genealogy. Um, Mark doesn't mention it at all. And then the Gospel of John uh, alludes to it, but John, who I love, love, love John, as Jesus did, as we all know, he was the beloved, um, um, told his whole gospel from a, a different aspect, more so of, of the Messiah, of the deity of the God. Amen. So I, I prefer the gospel of Luke is what I would tell, read to my kids on Christmas Eve. It's what the Charlie Brown famous episode yes. about Christmas was from, was yes. from the gospel of Luke when he talked about the angel and the shepherd. So anyway, let's get going. I'm going to ask someone to take, uh, we're going to read a couple passages and then we're going to stop and I have some points of discussion. Okay. So uh, there may be two or three pair i think we're going to verse 12 so somebody want to start this is the gospel of matthew in the new king james verse i mean the gospel of luke in the new king james version okay i can read it it's luke 1 1 through 25 and as much as many have taken in hand to set in order the narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us just as those whom from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seems good to be to me also having had perfect understanding of all the things, all things from the very first, to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. This you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Keep going. Mm hmm. Well. Okay. My phone is acting crazy. Hold on. All right. Yeah. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. The wife was the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blindless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And there were both, they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, a lot fell to burn incense. His lot fell to burn incense when and he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was, was praying out, outside of the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on oh my god on the right hand on the right side of the altar of incense and when Zechariah saw him he was troubled and fear fell upon him amen thank you brother McCurdy so uh, here's some points of discussion these events happen at a definite time somebody want to take these these two paragraphs, but take one and then pause and let, let's let's discuss it and then move to that little sentence at the end. These events had a, had a definite time. There was the man known as Herod the Great, who was the, at the end of a long and terrible regime. Ethnically, he was not a descendant of Israel, but of Jacob's brother Esau. Therefore, an Edomite and a with that 
Idiom. Indomil. <clears throat> and Indomil. He was known for his spectacular building program, but he even, but even more so for his paranoid cruelty, which drove him to execute many, including members of his own family. Crazy. Listen, that's what I'll get with. This man was a lunatic. Yes, he was, was a nut. <laughs> yes, now, but at the same time, he built these elaborate fortresses mm. and um. Uh, and so he he bought a lot of prosperity wherever he built these these cities. But he had this jealous streak, mm. where at the end he ended up killing his wife, her mom, mm. his mm. children. I mean, he just went on this killing yeah. spree. And so it, yeah. it's not hard to to believe that we get into it where he he calls for the death uh, of the baby Jesus because he's paranoid. Yeah. He's just, he's just a lunatic. He's a nut, a dangerous one. Uh, and I thought it was interesting uh, that his bloodline, you know, he was actually um, a, a, a proselyte or the descendant of a proselyte. He was, a, he was Arab, um, but practiced Judaism. Now, I thought that was, that was interesting. Amen. So, the Bible say nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. There have been many more like him since. Amen. One yeah. real recent who I won't name. New old in my lago, but we're going to go on. <laughs> <laughs> but Pastor, did, what, did he kill all his family? Because didn't after he was passed, did his son take over? He didn't kill all of them, but he killed, uh, he had more than one wife now. Oh, he, okay. killed, he killed her. Uh, and his own sister set it, set, set it all up and schemed with him. Uh, not his sister, her sister. His wife's sister, I believe, Salome. And mm. it's just, it, it, it's an interesting study. And one of, the, one of the sermons I'll be preaching in the journey to the cross uh, gets more detailed about him. The details escape me, but I, I remember doing the study. He's a hor- he was a horrible guy. Yeah. He was a horrible guy. And so those are the, the events that happen at this definite time, but they happen to uh, a definite people. I take this as just a sentence. The, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth were religious and obedient, yet also stigmatized by their barrenness. I've, I've oh, yeah. said, uh, mm. well, I don't know to you guys, but women had so little power in, those, in those times, and uh, having a baby was the one power that that women had and, oh. and it and it was you would be considered a social outcast if you it's could not produce happen. children uh, mm. you should be reminded of hannah that was hannah's problem hannah had mm-hmm. this uh was married to his name for uh and and, and and he and, had no she wasn't married uh, Nina was uh, the uh, other wife Eleanor. yeah Eleanor, something like that and his other wife Panina. Uh, could was spitting them out like like nobody business, uh, and what's more, she was cruel. She would pick at her, but it just and you know, and so it was it was it was it was such a social mm, no no. You were considered wealthy just if you had a whole lot of kids. One, wow. you had free labor. No, number one, you you, you had free labor. Uh, people, and if you had daughters. Uh, men would pay dowries, so you, they they were income. They were value on kids, mm-hmm. and the amount of kids that you could have. Uh, yeah. and, and like I said, it's not like that she could have gone to law school or uh, did any great thing because uh, in the world's eye, anyway. Now in Christ, women did a lot. It's just a lot. You have to unpack it and uncover it. But uh, and so yeah, at this point, who does they who do they remind you of? Zacharias and Elizabeth. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah. Uh huh. Can you imagine? He was. Uh, she was seventy-five. Forget how old he was. hundred. Having kids? Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> one week with my grandkids. That was enough. No. <laughs> no. At fifty-five. <laughs> so no. But yeah. So that's this is where we are. We're gonna continue on in the verses. Any any questions, cares, or comments thus far? Mm. so we know Herod was a nut uh, mm. 
Zacharias and Elizabeth, I would think had had just, I think I'm getting ahead of the lesson though, but just had got into this, this comfort of life, you know, they had gone this long without kids, probably decided they weren't going to have any and, and just got on with things. Oh, we're not done. Okay. Somebody get these <laughs> discussion points. This is what happened when you do the study early. Only priests from a particular lineage could serve in the temple. Over the years, the number of priests multiplied. There were said to be as many as 20,000 priests in the time of Jesus. So they used the lot to determine which priests would serve. The lot to serve might fall to a priest only once in his life. To let, a me, let me let's put, a, put, a, put a put in it right there. I want to I want to share something. This is this is huge. And see, this is what, what, what studying does, because it's going to make you look at this scripture differently the next time you read it. Um, specifically, uh, in Jesus's time, when it says there was as many as 20,000 priests. And do you remember wow. the story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan? Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, and then he was passed over by the Levite. He was passed over by the by the priest mm -hmm. that's because they were on their way to serve in the temple and if they touched anything dead they would be yeah. deemed unclean yeah. and could unclean. not serve yeah and so there they took and that was the whole point of jesus's story with is is they prioritized their service mm. in the kingdom or not the kingdom in the in the temple over helping someone in need wow uh, but they probably would serve two weeks this says out of their lifetimes mm. uh, and if you're in the ministry you know you on fire to serve you want to be up there you and and we're going to get into exactly what that looked like what the incense service looked like uh that's coming up but it was a big deal uh and so i'm sure zacharias was like kind of thrown off by the events that are, are, are coming up okay go ahead sister Anne. i'm sorry i'm jumping in to a godly man like zacharias this was probably the biggest event of his life, a tremendous privilege, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Surely he wondered what it would be like to enter the holy place. And if God had something special to speak to him in this special event of his life. Oh, well, he was excited. We can understand that, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see what, what exactly did his service entail? He wants to read to us about the incense. Discussion. To burn, to burn incense according to the law of Moses, incense was offered to God on the golden altar every morning and every, every evening. By this time, there was an established ritual for the practice. There were several... Go ahead. There were several lots cast to determine who did what at the morning sacrifice? The first lot determined who would clean, who would cleanse the altar and prepare its fire. The second lot determined who would kill the morning sacrifice and sprinkle the altar, the golden candlestick, and the altar of incense. The third lot determined who would come and offer incense. This was the most privileged duty. Those who received the first and second lots would repeat their duty at the evening sacrifice, <clears throat> but not the third lot. The offer, to offer the incense would be a once in a lifetime opportunity. So that should show us how how really special and important uh, what Zacharias was supposed to do was. Who knows what what lots mean? What do they mean when they say lots? That was my question. I was getting ready, just getting ready to ask that. <laughs> yeah, it's, was... it's like a lottery. It's like they the Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothing. It's like pulling what, straws. That's it right there. That's it right there. It's, it's the same thing like pulling straws. We'll get the short straw. Uh, except mm -hmm. that they believed that it was God-ordained. And the Bible says that it was. But that's how they made their selections. Amen. Interesting, right? Yeah. Oh, come Sister Odom. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Oh no, Evelyn Odom's coming in too. Okay. Amen. 
Are you are you home, Sister uh, Evelyn Odoms? As in discharge? I'm still at the hospital. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, okay. Well, we're happy to have you. Amen. All right. Who wants to take this last paragraph? Uh, before dawn, hundreds of worshipers gathered at the temple. The morning sacrifice began when the, oh, I can't even see, instant, instant priests walked toward the temple. Though the outer courts, he struck a gong-like instrument known as the your Magpura, guess as good as mine. The Magpura mm -hmm. and the sound. The Rip. Levites assembled and got ready to lead the gathered people in song of worship to God. Amen. So now we have a more of a visual of what Zachariah. Uh, Zacharias was expected to do. And Brother oh. Peter, this kind of reminds me of our discussion, I think, in the very first Sunday school I attended about how uh, temple worship was so much more involved than we can see even in the scriptures. Can you see that? I, do. I mean, did y'all get all of this was happening just from what we read? I didn't know so, that. I have a question. So that means one, one job was more important than the other jobs that's not that it was in, not that it i wouldn't say important uh but probably most coveted um most more significant mm -hmm. you know because the bible say that that every, every every part is important mm -hmm. um and then there was the fact that this was a the rest of them happened in the morning and the evening this was once okay so if you cast the lots for the incense you know and then you come out and you talk uh, to the crowd, you're like the head, I guess, of the whole ceremony. So in that way, it's, it's probably like the most significant. All right. So we're going to go through, I think, 13 to 18. I'm not sure. Let me see. Now we're going to go all the way to 25. Okay. Who wants to get this, this part? Are any other questions? But do you, can you see how what, what we read in the scripture now has been blown in our minds because we have the visual of these uh, various priests. It wasn't just Zacharias. It was more than him. It was a whole ceremony. It got people out there praying and waiting with the expectation. Can't advent. Amen. Okay. Somebody continue with verse 13. John, John go ahead. John's birth announced to Zechariah. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you should call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness and many rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in, in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's room. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the heads of the fathers of the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I hear this man just coming to do his little job. He's going to get once in his whole lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and this angel shows up and drops this on him. Amen. Mm. All right. Mm -mm. Somebody get this pair, this, these two. As Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well uh, advanced in years. And the angel answered, said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. Whoa, he got in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, this is the last, the last uh, four verses, then we'll go back to discussion. Somebody grab these. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled at it, that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned to them and remained, remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Now she was she was validated. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So somebody read that first bullet point for me. The discussion. The angel the angel stood on the right side of the altar of incense. Zacharias probably had his eye tightly shut in passion in a pa passionate prayer. And when he opened them, he saw this angel. Can you imagine his anticipation? Uh, <laughs> to be in service at the temple for this very important ceremony. Uh, and then all of a sudden this angel appeared. Mm. I, I probably would have been afraid. Somebody get the next bullet point. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. The angel who appeared to Zechariah was not a romantic figure or a naked baby with wings. This angel was a glorious, fearful, and an awesome creature. Like most angels in the Bible, the first thing this angel has to say to his human contact is, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It reminds me, and, and we do have these concepts of angels being these angelic figures that are just harmless looking, but you have to remember the angel of the Lord that stepped to Joshua, remember? And yeah. Joshua said, well, who did you come to help? You came to help me. You came to help them. And the guy said, I'm not on your side or their side. I came to take over. Uh, and, and I imagine him to be this, you know, this, this huge figure, uh, intimidating figure. And so uh, what we're learning here is that most of those angels were that. Uh, think of the angels that, and it, that, that sh just, just appeared, uh, some were made to look like men, but the angel that that spoke to uh, the shepherds, uh, mm -hmm. they were afraid at first. Mm -hmm. And so these were not angelic or cherub looking uh, heavenly creatures. These were intimidating. These Lord's angels. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Somebody get this last <laughs> bullet. Zacharias must, must have thought. Does this happen to everyone who does this? <laughs> <laughs> the other the other guys didn't tell me anything about this. Hey Amen. Can you imagine, especially you now, Rel? You getting ready to go to your service in the in the, in the temple where you've only ever been a parishioner, <laughs> and you got your colleagues, you on the phone. Like, so what happens? What do I do? What what do y'all do during that time before you come out? outside and, and right. show yourself to the people what's going on and nobody mentioned you anything about no big old heavenly creature showing up <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of your service amen mm, amen wow. Rev, that was short go ahead and take this other bullet Point. your prayer is heard your wife elizabeth will bear a son it is it is doubtful that zachariah prayed for a son when he was at the golden altar of the incense. First, it might have seemed like such a selfish need. Second, since he and Elizabeth were both well advanced in age, Luke 7, Luke 1, 7, they probably had given up on this prayer a long time ago. Long time ago. Amen. Amen. Go, go to that next bullet because it's asking questions. Sometimes we pray for something for a long, long time. We pray for the salvation of a spouse or a child. We pray for a calling or ministry. We pray that God would bring that special person to us. 
But after years of heartfelt prayer, we give up out of discouragement. Zacharias and Elizabeth probably prayed years of passionate prayer for a son, but gave up a long time ago and mm. stopped leaving God for so much more, much anymore. Mm. So can you see how big and wonderful God is? Mm. Think about the birth of uh, Elizabeth's son. Mm. The purpose he played in God's plan. Mm. And so with, with this, this one act of, of the conception of this son, uh, he fulfilled a desire that they had as a couple, which would restore them socially. Uh, but also, there was a promise on the life of that son to make mm. the way straight. Amen. That what the word is saying, Rev? Mm -hmm. To make the way yep. straight uh, yeah. for the coming Messiah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think this. Oh, no. We still got more to go. Okay. Someone get this bullet. There is no Zacharias. There is no John the Baptist. Mm. If there is no John the Baptist, there is no herald announcing the coming of the Messiah. Mm. If there is no herald announcing the coming of the Messiah, the prophecies of the Old Testament regarding the Messiah are unfulfilled. If any of the prophecies of the Old Testament regarding the first coming of the Messiah are unfulfilled, then Jesus did not fulfill all things. If Jesus did not fulfill all things, then he did not complete God's plan of redemption for you <laughs> and I, and we must perish in our sins. This was great news. The fact that, that all of that happened mm. is the good news. Mm -hmm. The beginning of the coming of Christ in, in reality or in the flesh. Whereas... Uh, Christ had always existed in the word now. You know, we know John says in the beginning was the word and the word was God. So it always existed. But then there were certain prophecies given by different men of God uh, about the, Isaiah from our sermon Sunday was, was one. Uh, I think, what's, what was that? Isaiah 11, one through 10. Mm -hmm. But he prophesied about the coming of, of Messiah. And, and so it had to come to pass. Jesus' plan will come to pass. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so I and I also want to say from this pers perspective, when when you are blessed, when you finally do see what you've been in prayer for manifested, please understand. 99% of the time, in my experience, is never just about you. Mm -hmm. this was not just about Zacharias and his wife this is about all of us on this zoom right now amen mm -hmm. that's how big God is okay. mm -hmm. somebody want to take the next bullet and the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long the custom was for the priest to come from the temple as soon as he was finished praying to assure the people that he had not been struck dead by God. Uh, Zechariah's <laughs> delay, uh, right. delay had started to make the crowd nervous. They thought the man was in there dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's taking him? Imagine them looking at their watches. What, what's taking him so long? My goodness. He must be dead. You go. No, you go. You know. Mm -hmm. No, she'll be cool to the dead in the temple. I ain't going. <laughs> and he's standing there in fear. And then disbelief. <laughs> All right. Hey, Pastor. Yes, sir. That kind of reminds me of in the book of Exodus when Moses was on the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights. Mm. And all the people stood at the, at the foot of the mountain waiting for him. Mm. They all st stood there waiting and wondering what was taking him so long. Yes. and But they didn't wait. Right. They said, well, yeah, yeah. he not going to come through with that God. We're going to make one of our own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Impatient, stiff neck people, the Bible calls stiff neck mm -hmm. people. Amen. That was a good, good insight, Brother Rogers. All right. Who got the next bullet? After the incident priest finished, he came out of the holy place through the great doors of the temple 
and met the other two priests right outside the doors. The, the instant priest raised his hands and blessed the people with the blessings from new, Numbers 6, 24 to 26. <laughs> the, hundred of, the hundreds of gathered worshipers knew what to do. They responded by saying, bless, bless be the Lord God, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. After all this, the Levites got the worship singers and musicians started. They began with a blast from the special silver trumpets. Mm. Then a priest struck the cymbals and the choir of Levites became, began to sing the Psalm of the day. The choir was made up of not less than 12 voices which mingled young and old for a full range mm. of sound and probably some great harmony. Amen. Mm -hmm. So what was the punishment? Uh, Y'all, I do tend to get ahead of the lesson. I'm mm -hmm. quiet. Be quiet. So now we can see that this, this was no just lighting the incense and, 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 and saying the Lord's prayer and then going out the door and waving to the people. This was much more involved. They had precision where the, the, the priests had to come out together and uh, meet up, at least out, uh, on the outside. They, they had this uh, uh, interaction with the crowd and the crowd would respond. Um, amen. Then the musicians got going. They was having a hallelujah good time. Uh, they were meant to. But then, but then, but then Zach, Zachariah showed out. And then, then somebody get this next bullet. So I'm getting ahead again. When Zechariah came out, he was supposed to stand on the temple step, overlooking the crowd, and pronounce the priestly blessing on the people, number 6, 24 to 26. And the other priest would repeat it after him. But Zechariah couldn't speak. Continue. Doing the best he could through hand motion, he told the story of what happened to him in the temple. <laughs> it's hard to know if everyone believed him. And that's something he come out doing sign language. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they, they trying to understand. I don't know if he's swatting flies or what's going on. Uh, they might have been relieved that he, he was not dead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I give, give it that. But so why would that be a punishment? Why would him not being able to speak? Because he doubted. His unbelief. Right. That's why he was punished. But why mm -hmm. that way? Because he was looking forward to, to performing that task. And after he couldn't complete it, that. Yeah. I would, I would have to believe as a preacher, as a minister, that that was the best part. Mm -hmm. To be able to come out and the crowd saw that you were the priest of incense. You was you was running this show. You was the, the worship leader, so to speak. <laughs> but it's a good but thing. But he couldn't say nothing. Pastor, but um so but the people knew to say to recite the numbers, the, the blessing over the people. Well, it's it's telling us that that was the order of the service. He was supposed to say he was supposed to bless the people, and they were to respond. And uh, but he couldn't talk. Okay. Apparently, whatever he did with his motions, they they understood to some degree. It said he didn't believe that everybody believed him, but they did apparently respond. Uh, so this so, is the big. Go ahead. So, uh, so is this what they do every time? Was that the practice to recite the um, numbers after the incense um, ceremony? Yeah, that was the that was the that was the ceremony, and there were many different ones. Remember us discussing this uh, in Sunday school, brother Peter. The detail of the worship is is much more than what we know today. It was very detailed, very precise. Um, and you don't really get that from just so, reading the passage, the so depth could they, of it. So could they have thought that he was cursed or something like that? Because I, I he would, wasn't I would able? Think, I would think given the, the mindset in the times 
you know, remember when uh, Jesus came across the blind man and the disciple says, well, who committed the sin, him or his parents? Yeah. Uh, because the, the belief system back then was that if something bad had oh, happened to you, happened. if you were born you uh, physically challenged or deaf, mm -hmm. mute or whatever, uh, you, that you were cursed. Mm -hmm. So I, I would have to believe that would have been a prevalent uh, a belief. And so that would be why, for all of those reasons, uh, that he got that particular punishment. If, if Pastor, if you read verse 22, it tell you um, when he came out, he could not speak to them and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple mm -hmm. where he beckoned them he beckoned to them and remained speechless so they 22 is saying they think he saw a vision in the temple yeah, yeah. yeah. well again <laughs> the the prevalent fear when he had taken longer than it would normally take was that he had died uh, so mm -hmm. we have to remember what what human nature is first I would think they would be relieved uh, when he did finally come through the door. And then when he couldn't speak, they probably thought he was shocked. Something dumb. Shocked dumb uh, where he couldn't speak. But then, you know, he was able to, to, to do some motioning. Uh, but at any rate, we, we, we wanted to show, uh, and when I say we, I mean I, uh, <laughs> How extravagant these, these ceremonies were, how detail-oriented these people were. This was their worship. Uh, we vilify them a lot uh, in modern times. We say, you know, uh, legalism and this and that, but legalism had a purpose uh, before Christianity. It was the only way they, they knew to worship God. It was the only way they knew to have a relationship with God. It was based on their behavior. That covenant was behavior based. It was about what they did. Uh, and of course, we are all under the new covenant, which is relationship based. So Judaism is the history of Christianity. Amen. And so that, that has a lot to do with my interest in the culture and why they did what they did. If, if you know the culture, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, and then you're able to better decide or discern what is relevant to our now. So what we can take from this lesson is, now, first of all, if I see an angelic being standing in front of me, I'm believe whatever he tell me. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't take off running. <laughs> that I'll pass out. True. True that. Uh, but it's, it's to not doubt is to not doubt. And that's prevalent throughout the Bible. Don't, don't doubt God. And if we maintain our relationship with God and grow in our relationship with God, then and he will do signs and wonders, maybe not on the scale that he did in the Bible days, but you should have genuine God and Christ experiences. Amen. Uh, to where you know that, that, that it was God. Okay. Pastor, I have another question. So when mm -hmm. people say God spoke to me and said such and such and such. Is this what you, what, 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 what you mean as far as? You know, I actually spoke to somebody about that today. Um, I will often say God said. And sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, it's, sometimes it can be, uh, I don't want to say audible in the way like I hear it through my ears. Uh, but definitely in my heart, um, I'll get impressions or visions. Um, I mean, he's God. It's not limited. Now, do I believe when anybody says or everybody says God, especially if they're telling me something God said. Now, that's the first red flag. If it's new to me, that's a red flag for me. Because what I know about prophecy is that it's, it's affirming and confirming. Nobody should be walking up telling you something you ain't never heard before. It's usually God sending people to confirm what he's already whispered to you. Um, so that, wow. that, that, wow. that, that's been my experience. Uh, and cause my first thought is, well, why didn't he tell me about it? My phone work, <laughs> but what, you know, uh, and, and a lot of times, you know, uh, 
Well, we know the scripture says to beware of uh, wolves in sheep clothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and here's the thing. This is this this will be an interesting point. The the FBI and this this may not sound like it's going to connect, but it will. The FBI in the counterfeit department. They don't study counterfeit bills. They only study actual genuine bills. So when they see a counterfeit, the they can pick it right off. Mm -hmm. And that makes with, sense. with that in mind, I say stay in the word mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and don't read the Bible, study the Bible. And when you're not studying, it requires more than just the Bible to study. Amen. And Ooh. then uh, in study, meditate over it pray, get revelation about it, and you will hear God's voice. And so when somebody comes up with some nonsense, you're going to know it ain't God because you have your own personal, genuine relationship with God. <coughs> Amen. Remember we talked about last week about genuine uh, salvation and, and what your relationship uh, should look like. Don't be intimidated by what somebody else claims that they're doing or, or have. Amen? Amen. Pastor, you know, yes, I, I, I could tell you a story. Tell us a story. But that happened to me. <laughs> During the time I was incarcerated, mm -hmm. I met a young man from Clearwater, Florida. I had never right. seen this guy before. This guy came to me one afternoon. I was sitting out in the day room in the county jail. And he uh -huh. came up to me and told me, said, God told me to tell you when you get out to go back to your church, your wife mm -hmm. will be waiting on you. <laughs> and I looked at him like he was crazy. Wow. <laughs> you know, oh, and I'm like, I'm saying to myself, what wife? <laughs> so I get out of prison and I go to two different churches looking for a wife. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny part about it, I didn't have transportation to get to neither one of these churches. Mm -hmm. But Greater St. Paul was right down the street from me. So I go to Greater St. Paul. Reverend Davis was in his office. My mm -hmm. wife right now, that I have right now, was sitting in the, in the second row of the church. Mm -hmm. I sat behind her. Mm -hmm. And I looked around to see how good she was looking, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking and I'm looking. Go ahead, brother Jim. Go ahead, Jim. And I'm like, <laughs> the Lord told me to come back to my church. <laughs> Wait, I'm looking like he said, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be looking for. Him. So, because was this, was this your church? I joined Greater St. Paul in 1983. Mm -hmm. Before but I was the incarceration? Member, but I left and I. I joined Antioch in West Palm Beach. Ooh. So I was okay. I went to Ant I went to Antioch thinking my wife was up there. I see. So the way God fixed it, because I didn't have transportation to get back and forth, <laughs> I had to come back to Greater St. Paul. <laughs> All right. So All right. After, All right. Get, after coming there, Joanne was sitting in the second pew. Man. I sat behind her. Mm. And I went to looking around trying to see how good her face looked. <laughs> so, I want to know what God said to her. I'm, I'm trying to find out what it was. How you know what it is? So, so you're saying that you had no prior knowledge? No, I didn't have no prior knowledge of any of this. When the guy wow. told me that God said, go back to your church. Your wife will be waiting on you. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, my wife was in Greater St. Paul waiting. All right. Were, were you waiting, Sister Joanne? Nope. <laughs> she was. She was waiting. She just didn't know. <laughs> both y'all. Both y'all. Both y'all missed the memo. <laughs> I think that's 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 a beautiful testimony. And, uh, but but I, I I still in my experience it's, it's it, it was it's never been something new. Uh, yeah. that that was unknown. I, I don't doubt it was God ordained. Now, I'm not saying that. Uh, but as far as people coming up and telling you these off the hand wall things, you know, be a discerner. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah. you must have, your, your heart must have been 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 on fire for a wife 
Uh, yeah, you went to three churches looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's good. Amen. Amen. God is That's good. Awesome. When that end is beautiful. It's be How long y'all been married? 26 years. Wow. It's a long time. Yes. 26 long years. Time. Wow. We we did thirty two, but I still can't understand. Well, I, I forget we lied. I, I, I still can't believe it. <laughs> wow! Yeah. It's a beautiful thing when you when it works. Amen. When you get you get past that first decade, you should be good. Yeah. Amen. But love looks good on you, you guys. Let me yes. say that. Yes, love they do. They look good on the Rogers. Perfect then. couple. Perfect. They are. They are. Amen. Yeah. Amen. The yin to her yang. Yes. Yeah. And so. brother, brother Peter and Sister Anne, congratulations on y'all's what 47th year? Was it? 47th year. Oh, yeah. brother David, I didn't know uh you were you were even on there. Okay. Uh, just yes. say Connie Regelman. Yeah, the boss. <laughs> that's the boss. So <laughs> yes, man. Amen. All yeah. right. Well, that's our lesson thus far. When we come back next week, we'll get into the pregnancy of Elizabeth. And of course, when she and uh, Mary meet up. Um, and so this is this is the cadence. This is this is how we'll we'll proceed. Uh, hopefully so that when when you read this scripture over again, you'll be able to, to understand and appreciate mm -hmm. what Zacharias had had gone through and and uh, what was at stake uh, in his in his mind. Any questions, cares, concerns, or remarks? Oh, it was beautiful. Amen. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to ask God Lewis Stewart in the person of Sister Connie Riggleman to pray us out. Amen. 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 All hearts, minds clear? Yes, ma'am. All right. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, oh God, as we dive yes. deeper into your word, oh God. Yes. Thank you that we can apply it to our lives, oh God. Let us not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Yes. Oh, my, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for Pastor Sapp and, yes, and Reverend so. Santo, yes. oh God. We thank you, Father, for each and every yes. member that is who joined us on tonight, Zoom, oh God. Lord Jesus, thank you. May your peace be with each and every one of us and our families, oh God. We Please. thank you, Father, for your healing virtue for Sister Evelyn Oldham, oh God. Yes. We thank you. Yes. Touch it from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. Yes, yes, yes. We give you glory and honor, oh God, for what you're doing in her life, for the yes, healing God. that is taking place right now. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That hospital room, oh God, that they will feel yes. your presence there, anointing. Yes, yes. yes Lord. Thank yes, you, Lord. Father. Thank you Thank for you. those who may be sick among us. Um, yes, Lord. Jesus. Brother Lionel, oh God, we thank yes. you for his healing yes. right now. Yes. Thank you. Right now. Jesus. Anyone yes. else who may be sick in their bodies, Father? Jesus. Yes. We declare Jesus. healing to their bodies right now. Yes. 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 Not just the body, oh God, but the mind, the emotion. Yes. 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 And most of all, the spiritual healing right thank now in the name of Jesus. Now in the name of Jesus. Thank we you. thank you, Father. Thank Hallelujah. You. Thank As you. we continue to study your word, yes, that you will get the glory and honor in all things that we do. In yes. Jesus' name, amen. Jesus. Amen. 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 I think, uh, want to thank Sister Lola, who's watching us on Facebook, and Sister Sandra Hensey, Hensey uh, yeah. who's watching us on the amen. Facebook, and I missed whoever came in earlier. Amen. amen. All right. I hope to see you guys Sunday. Saturday. Another Saturday. Oh, yeah. Saturday <laughs> for the funeral. There's a funeral yeah. Saturday. The wake is five. Well, Friday night. Friday evening. The, the wake is 
yeah, but the time is kind of hinky. I, I think it's for the public from six to eight and from the family oh. from five to six. Oh. And then the funeral is 11 a.m. And then to see you back here on, on Sunday morning for another intentional, powerful worship. Amen. 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 I love you all because I love you each. Amen. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.